Welcome. Welcome to a topic in the webinar series, Hypertension and Atrial Fibrillation, a risky couple even more when the family expands. Professor Thomas Mengden will present for us hypertension and atrial fibrillation in secondary prevention. Thomas Mengden is the head of Rehabilitation and Excellence Center Hypertension ESH, Bad Neuheim, in Germany. We look forward to your lecture. Okay. Thank you uh, for the uh, nice introduction. Whereas, as already mentioned, I'm head of the Excellence Center and Cardiac Rehabilitation. At our campus, we have 8,500 hypertension-related hospitalizations per year. Um, and in our inpatient cardiac rehabilitation, we treat 1,000, approximately 1,900 uh, patients for inpatient cardiac rehabilitation per year. From these patients, 90% have arterial hypertension, so very uh, often diagnosis. 40% have any form of atrial fibrillation, 40%. 10% present with paroxysmal or postoperative atrial fibrillation. And 6% have a new episode of atrial fibrillation during three weeks inpatient rehabilitation. So in the next slide, I give you a brief um, summary how rehabilitation works in Germany because it's different from other countries. We have inpatient rehabilitation more often than outpatient rehabilitation. And during this process, we have two uh, transitions. One transition from the clinic, either the cardiology or the heart surgery, to inpatient rehabilitation. The inpatient rehabilitation, it lasts about three to four weeks. And the second transition is from inpatient rehabilitation to home. And I will focus my talk on the second transition, the patient going home after inpatient rehabilitation. Next. So what are our diagnostic and therapeutic challenges in inpatient rehabilitation? The patient, patients, all of our patients, after a short uh, introduction and teaching, they self-monitor their blood pressure and their pulse. So we have daily monitoring of blood pressure and heart rate by the patients themselves, and they document blood pressure and heart rate in their logbooks. I will sh later show you two examples. The indications for this monitoring are, of course, hypertension or either hypotension, heart failure, and arrhythmias. The next challenge is the indication for oral anticoagulation, which often is discussed, and the recommended time for oral anticoagulation after discharge from our clinic. We are the ones who recommend for the family physician how long he should continue oral anticoagulation, either for three months or for six months or without a limit. Then we have on this chart of the patient, we have to give a recommendation for monitoring, for example, of blood pressure or pulse or ECG at home. And finally, the patient's logbooks may indicate, as you will see, an irregular or increasing or decreasing pulse, but cannot be definitely conclusive. I will give you two examples in the next slide. These are examples of two patients. The first patient, uh, you see the logbook it tries with the systole and the diastolic blood pressure. And on the right, uh, thank you for zooming, uh, the um, heart rate or the pulse rate, which in the first patient is 49 to 84 beats per minute. Obviously, from these readings, you can't make a diagnosis, whether it's sinus rhythm or atrial fibrillation. And the second patient, we also have a range of pulse per minute from 46 to 78 uh, per minute. Also, this patient, we cannot tell 
from the logbook and tries what kind of rhythm is in the patient. I have can tell you at this um, place that we will see those two patients in the three cases I present you. The first is a patient with permanent atrial fibrillation and the second a pa patient with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. Next slide, please. So these are the three cases I present you. They are from my first series with the Omron Complete from March 8 to March 10. Case one is a patient with condition after aortic valve replacement, condition after mitral valve replacement, condition after coronary bypass surgery. All patients as the first patients had arterial hypertension and some kind of atrial fibrillation. In the first case, it's permanent atrial fibrillation. The second case is a patient with condition after cabbage, coronary bypass surgery. He also had arterial hypertension in his medical history and the diagnosis of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. That means he had already atrial fibrillation of paroxysmal nature before his surgery, um, and after surgery. And the third case is a patient not from the heart surgery, a patient with a STEMI of the um, apical region of the heart with a formation of a big apical aneurysm. Um, he also had in his medical history arterial hypertension and as rhythm disturbances, peri-interventional atrial fibrillation peri-interventional non-sustained ventricular tachycardia and bradycardia. So in the next examples, I will show you the ECGs of these three cases. The first case is the patient with the permanent atrial fibrillation. This is his 12-channel ECG. And you see from lead one to lead three that this patient obviously is in atrial fibrillation. So how does the complete analyze look like? We will see it in the next slide. This is the same patient. You see the date of the recording is March 9. So it's the second day of my series. And at that point, he had a heart rate of 99 beats per minute. The recording time was one minute as recommended. Uh, his systolic blood pressure was 108 millimeters mercury, his diastolic blood pressure 82 millimeters mercury, and the correct analysis of the complete is that atrial fibrillation is possible and you see it can be confirmed. So the next case is case two. This is the patient with a paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. It was the patient with condition after coronary bypass surgery, and uh, we see the normal ECG, the 12-channel ECG, and obviously here we have a sinus rhythm of 61 beats per minute. So on the next slide, I show you the corresponding complete recordings, and this patient with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation recorded on Thursday, uh, March 9, uh, the heart rate was 56 beats per minute, the blood pressure was 123 systolic and 71 millimeters mercury diastolic, and the correct analysis is a normal rhythm. So the last case is the most challenging one. This is a patient with a peri-interventional atrial fibrillation uh, and low voltage after myocardial infarction. Um, he had an apical aneurysm and uh, you see the uh, reduced R amplitudes uh, in the normal ECG and in the next uh, slide you see the uh, obvious um, signs of an apical aneurysm. So what was the corresponding complete recording? Next slide, please. This is the 
complete recording and you see that we have a very reduced R amplitude and uh, big uh, deep negative T waves. So it was very uh, difficult to make a correct analysis and the uh, analysis was that it could not be identified, the rhythm. So it, I think in patients with a uh, low voltage ECG with a reduced R amplitude, it's very difficult to make a correct automatic analysis. So let me come to my conclusions. Uh, cardiac rehabilitation patients have a high prevalence of hypertension and different forms of atrial fibrillation. The complete device may be useful for diagnostic monitoring and therapeutic decisions back at home. In my point of view, first use should be supervised by a cardiologist, and a cardiologist should also be the one who recommends or prescribes the device because in some patients we have limitations. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much. This was very interesting to see how you use this in your practice. Um, before we go to a couple of other questions, I also have one personal question. If a patient would present during so much time with only one time a short episode of atrial fibrillation, mm -hmm. do you immediately follow that by anticoagulation? Well, it depends obviously on the chest vesc uh, risk uh, certification, but I can tell you in patients with structural heart disease and cardiac rehabilitation, uh, we don't see uh, patients with a chest score of zero or one, All most of them have a risk scores of two, three, four or five. So uh, there is an indication for oral anticoagulation even after a single episode. And um, the very interesting questions in these post-operative patients is uh, how long they have paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. So we want to know whether we should limit the oral anticoagulation to three months or six months or uh, longer. Yeah, that was actually the, the issue that I had once at hand yeah. after bypass surgery. One nothing before, very low risk, not high risk enough mm. to have uh, an indication, but still had one episode of short atrial fibrillation. And mm -hmm. so sometimes you get a little bit and then you, you let your clinical judgment lead, of course. The other question mm. that I got in is, uh, why should cardiologists give a recommendation or a prescription? Yes, um, I think we can't leave the patient alone. Uh, with uh, the ECG. For the blood pressure, obviously, it is not a problem. Many patients purchase their, the devices on their own, and um, the use is very easy. I think also the use of the ECG is very easy, but um, you have to explain the patient a little bit, the medical background, why you do this analysis, and um, also the patient may encounter technical difficulties in first use, for example, with a low voltage uh, ECG, and then you have to decide whether this is a suitable candidate for self-monitoring. Yeah. So I, I think some kind of teaching and some kind of short introduction, I would advise the first measurement to be supervised, and if the patient has proven that it works and he get, gets a good ECG, then he can go on at home for himself. And if people are applying this, I think there should still over time be some interaction, right, between cardiology and the patient. Mm -hmm. how, do you, yeah. how do you plan that? What are your, how do you work in the daily basis with that? Can you expand a little bit on that? Yes, uh, I can only speculate <laughs> on it because I've uh, seen the device the last week for the first time. Okay. Um, uh, so, um, um, well, if you were to work I, with this device, eh, 
yes, would you like yes, to yes. see them every half yeah. year yeah, yeah. and go uh, over the know. results with them? Yeah. yeah. yeah normally, um, the uh, the patients they are uh, supervised by their treating cardiologist, mm -hmm. and uh, he sees them. Let's say after one or three months. Uh, after discharge from uh, our clinic, and um, well, um, so at that time he decides um, he decides how long oral anticoagulation should be given. So, yeah. if the patient is in strictly sinus rhythm at each day of the monitoring after three months, you can uh, consider to stop oral anticoagulation. If, on the other hand, he has some episodes, even rare episodes, of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, then uh, we would continue oral anticoagulation. Oh, that's a very good point that you raised there, because in the past we were not able to take such decisions easily because we don't have endless uh, Holter monitoring in patients. But now we have this information, and therefore we can sort of personalize a little bit more the treatment. Mm -hmm. Yes. I think uh, this is of additional diagnostic value because uh, we can do Holter ECG 24 hour, 72 hour, but uh, even then we might miss some uh, rare episodes of atrial fibrillation. You're absolutely right. And I I want to thank you for this really nice presentation, specifically so case-based that you took us through your short experience mm -hmm. and showed these cases how mm -hmm. the ECG correlates nicely or the Holter correlates nicely with the um, new device. I want to thank you for being with us and sharing this mm -hmm. information. And, um, and that's it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.